Blog Talk Radio. 2017. Big truth. The big talk for you. What up? Shout out Apple King. Big Boo. Me. Shout out everybody. Check it. Hey, yo, the big talk for you so you can absorb. Information get charged so you can afford. Get poppin'. Live off the greatest doctrine Sip the juice, know the ledge like the great rock him On a mission, not a small time thing Defense biblical, all sense Got the haters watching, hands and skill Footwork is still, get in the den See if you can stand for real If you rep him and cool, yo I rep Israel If you Torah based only, or new as well Welcome to listen, style always fair decision Two sides come together to compare what's written Seeking the facts, seeking the match Teaching the acts, leaking the tracks Call while you eating your snacks Music in my bones, DNA, C, double E and K Little something for the showtime, it's a play One love Shalom Israel. This is Brother Robert, a.k.a. Pastor Nobody, from the Fountain of Israel Bible Studies class. You can find us on thefountainofisrael.com or use the search box on YouTube and type in Fountain of Israel. You can also email us at foibiblestudies at inbox.com. Again, that is foibiblestudies at inbox.com. We believe the whole Bible is the truth and relevant to our lives today. Join us weekly as we feed the flock with the uncut word of God. Matthew 4 and 4 says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So until next time, this is Pastor Nobody. Search the scriptures and prove all things. Shalom, Israel. Hi. This is Tyrone Thompson, host of the Blog Talk Radio broadcast, Talk Real Solutions. Please tune in and listen to all of our shows seven nights a week at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. At Talk Real Solutions, we cover a variety of topics to ensure we speak about what may be needed in our community at any time. Talk Real Solutions is the hottest Blog Talk Radio show going on right now. You can listen to our broadcast at www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash talk real solutions or visit our website at www.talkrealsolutions.com. Also like our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash talk real solutions. You can call in at any time during the show and add to the conversation and offer your solutions at 1-858-357-8453. That's 1-858-357-8453. Because at Talk Real Solutions, we want to make sure you have a chance to talk real solutions. Never allow the possibility of your heart desire to trouble your mind, whether it is success or happiness, because your mind is a powerful machine that is very capable of manifesting anything that it conceives and believes in. Become more enlightened about life and the subconscious mind by visiting courtsforthemind.com. You are only as strong as the thoughts that constantly dwell in your mind. Therefore, never allow any negative belief about your abilities in life to be granted shelter in your mind. Edmund Mbiaka, BoothForTheMind.com
that's our popular demand. You're now listening to the Big Talk View Radio. Yo, what up? It's your boy K for H, representing East New York, Brooklyn. I'm in the building with my man Sal Showtime. He holding it down with the Debate Talk for You radio. Tune in every Monday through Friday, 8 p.m. Eastern. Also, check out that late nights and early morning mixtape and that black hoodie-ish mixtape. It's your boy K for H, and you're now listening to Debate Talk for You radio. Certified, stamped it, approved it. This is Renald Francois representing from Atlanta, Georgia. And when I'm not busy in the studio, I'm checking out Debate Talk for You Radio. Keep up the great work, Sal Showtime. Hey, what's going on, everybody? How you guys doing? Welcome to another show. You're now listening to Season 7 of Debate Talk for You Radio. Of course, I'm your host, Sal Showtime. And we are back with another classic show for you guys. Well, it is Monday. You know what that means. Every other Monday we have the segment called The Relationship Challenge. This is episode 31. That's right. So for the new listeners out there, if you missed uh, some of the series of The Relationship Challenge, you can always go back to the archives and go check it out. Make sure you go to the archives at www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash debate talk for you. We're also on iTunes in the podcast section. Just type in the search box debate talk for number four in the letter U. And uh, subscribe absolutely free, and make sure you give us five stars on iTunes. Put us on the top of the list there. And, of course, we're going to be on YouTube if you miss any part of the show. Today's show is entitled, The Practical Application of the Torah Concerning Marriage, Separation, and Divorce. Once again, today's show is entitled, The Practical Application of the Torah Concerning Marriage, Separation, and and divorce. All right, my special guests are standing by, of course, the home panel, and of course, the host of this particular program. She is here as well, the hardest working woman on social media. Call her the first lady. Hey, 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 hey. shalom, 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 all praise be to the most out of holy one of creation. Giving thanks. Brother Sal, how are you this evening? Sal, are you there? Can't hear anybody. All right, I am back. Why talk ready to bump me off the show? <laughs> and it's crazy. I'm the host of the platform. But we are back. All right, Amuna, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I was like, is it me? Was my? I didn't know if it was my end or your end that froze up, so I had to call in again. But, uh, yeah, the best one brother, Sal. We're glad that you're back. How was everything? Uh, we're doing pretty good. Um, let people know what's going on with you. What's happening? <clears throat> You know, the usual, <laughs> taking care of business, researching, you know. Um, oh, yeah, we have, oh, that's what's happening. If you are an entrepreneur, if you have your own business, if you uh, are an artist, we're going to have the Shine Virtual Business Expo. This is what we're planning to do at the end of the month. It's a virtual business expo where it is that you can come in and have a conversation, show your wares, but more of a personal um, interaction as opposed to just, hey, here's my product, buy my product. And so it's a new venture that's being launched to kind of, to kind of help out up-and-coming entrepreneurs to get a little bit of shine um, in this very, very busy social media space. So once again, you can go to um, www.heal.events with an S to find out more information. I also just did an informational video like last week if you want to know a little bit about what in the world is a virtual Expo. So once again, artists, poets, you know what I'm saying, whatever it is that you do that you want to get out to the public. So check that out. 
All right, so make sure you support the projects. Like I said, Amuna is the hardest working woman out here. Man, I'm telling you, she's doing that work out here on social media. <laughs> we definitely appreciate you coming on and being the host of the show. Of course, you have to go to the home panel. Oh, by the way, just letting y'all know, I uh, got a word from uh, Water Swordsman. He's not going to be able to make it tonight uh, due to Passover. He's not going to make it tonight. Uh, so, you know, we appreciate the brother. I guess we'll see him in the next uh, lesson challenge. But uh, I got my brother, Quete. What's going on, my brother? Welcome to the show. Thank you, Sal. Thank you, Muna. It's been a long day, but I'm here. <laughs> Welcome, brother. Oh, hey, uh, now. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank man. You. Quite, what's happening with you, brother? What's happening? You know, you're another hard worker right here, doing a lot of work. What's going on, brother? Oh, uh, just working, going around, traveling, lecturing. It's been fun, and it's amazing. Actually, um, I can share this. I was in a plane going to Trinidad and Tobago, and the lady next to me was on her laptop, and she was listening to debate talk for you radio. And I was impressed. I was like, oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <going everywhere. laughs> we all over the world. That's right. <laughs> I know. I was like, oh, that's yeah. impressive. So, and yeah. I thought, I thought yeah. that was amazing. I thought that was amazing. So, yeah. We everywhere. We everywhere. <laughs> that's right. That's right. We're all over the world. All over the world. I uh, appreciate yeah. you, man, for coming on the panel, of course. And uh, we have my sister right here. She's, yeah, she just joined in. Yeah, here we go. This is Mayana. What's going on, Mayana? Welcome to the show. Hey, Shalom, Sal. How you doing? What's Can going on over there with you? What's happening? Hey, you out of clear. Oh, we, How you doing? <laughs> we stepping up over here because all the, all the cool babies are in the house. So, you know, we're doing a lot of birthday trips. And it's my birthday, my nephew's birthday, my cousin's birthday, my brother's birthday. So, I'm still cooking. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I hear the pot sizzling. I, <laughs> I hear the pot <laughs> sizzling and all that over there. There we go. Got you, got you. But that's cool. We still got to show what's going on, though. It's all good. That's right. All right, so, um, Amuna, you can take it away, Amuna. Go ahead. I think the, a conversation is going to be centered around the confusion uh, throughout the nation, really, of, of how to practically approach um, the text as it relates to relationships forming these unions, and we've spoken about this before in different times and spaces. We've done conversations like, did, you know, is it better to marry than to burn? Uh, did the Messiah do away with divorce? Um, you know, should you involve your family and friends in making uh, marriage decisions? And so we've talked about this in different spaces, and we kind of wanted to bring it all together. We actually heard, I actually heard a roundtable that happened last Monday, and I thought a question was on the roundtable, so I, I thought um, myself and Sister Mina was like, there were, there was a lot of things that weren't able to come out during that, that time, and, and people reached out with some questions. Um, and so we said, hey, why not bring back the topic again in this space, and let's continue this conversation of what ifs and scenarios. So the way in which this is done, because a lot of times we're not realizing that this text is not necessarily cut and dry. Um, there are different scenarios that comes up, and this is why, you know, we, we had a judicial system. We had a, a system in which you can hear. This is why it says make you judges from those among you, that they can hear these matters and, and deliberate on these matters and bring back right judgment. One of the issues that the Mosai took with the nation of Israel is that when the Mosai says he looked down to see if in the book of Isaiah, if any was right, and then he said he saw no, not one, and he had to use his own hand to work salvation because judgment was missing out of the land, right judgment, righteous judgment, um, just weights and balances. And so this is the area, um, one that we are struggling heavily in in this space and time, the area of relationships. You know, everybody wants to talk about if you take the, the, the social temperature of social media, you, you know, at least eight out of ten of the posts are going to be about relationships and whether or not the, how the relationships are so bad or terrible, blah, 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 all of these other things. Um, and so this is kind of what we're going to talk about tonight in these spaces. And I know we, you know, we're not going to be able to go in depth, in depth, but hopefully we'll be able to explore and at least bring some level of clarity for those who may be listening in um, when you have these situations and you're actually going to the Torah and going to the Tanakh to find out what can you do, 
you know, how can you apply this law practically and not transgress the will and the laws of the creator? So with that said, I hope that was a little bit clear about what we're trying to achieve here tonight. Um, and I'll, I'll definitely open up with Brother Clutch. I know he stays a little tired, but uh, being that, you know, he was on the panel from last Monday and he had some things that I, I in my estimation, he wasn't able to fully get out, I'll open the conversation with him and hear uh, his opening uh, thoughts on it. Brother Clutch, the mic is yours. Can you hear me? Make it sure I'm not a mute. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, um, I did enjoy that round table. I was thinking it was a round table and not a debate, but it kind of went that way. And you should know how to pick your battle. So I didn't say a lot of what I wanted to say because I think I wasn't being heard. Um, what I was trying to say is, We have a text, and the text doesn't give us everything. What I mean it doesn't give us everything is it doesn't answer all the scenarios that if you're living in the community, issues that come up, the text doesn't address every single one of it. So we cannot go strictly by what the text says. The text says you should give a divorce, you should write a get, hand it to your wife if you want to get a divorce. But that's all it says. It doesn't answer all the questions that one needs to know before you even write the get. What if children are involved? What if the both parties own the house that they live in? No, the cars. What if the woman owns everything and the man is just not working yet? All these questions are not answered because what we're doing is we want to debate every topic and not put it in the context of a community because the moment you put it in the context of a community, now the dynamics change. And I I try to explain that there is oral transmission. There is oral transmission. And what I think I was not able to get across to the panelists was that the Torah was given orally. For 39 years, everything that they did was transmitted orally. It was passed on to them. The text was written later. So when you go in the text, Moses wrote things that he wasn't specific. He did not have to be specific because they've been doing these things for almost 40 years. So when he says, do this according to what I've commanded, and he doesn't specify, it doesn't mean that we are at a loss. We've been keeping these commandments for the past 3,600 years. So we go back to the communities that are keeping the text and say, how do you guys interpret this? It's not clear in the text. And I think I wasn't heard when I say that or when I said that because we're debating the topics, but we're not being realistic about them. All right, thank you for that opening, Brother Clutcher. You bring up some questions I'm definitely going to ask to kind of illustrate or demonstrate, I think, what you were trying to uh, speak to um, during the conversation. And for those who have not heard the conversation around the table, feel free to check it out, you know, on YouTube and debate talk for you um, on blog talk. But for the take of time and space, just to, to, you know, the conversation was directly on divorce. But the, but the, the, the point is that this one we're going to talk about you know, the marriage, we're going to talk about the separation, and is there a difference between separation and the actual uh, divorce? And hopefully we can touch or brush on those areas. But before we do, uh, let's see if we can hear Sister Mayana's opening comments on this subject. Sister Mayana. Hey, Shalom, everybody. As as it Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we still can't hear you kind of breaking up and uh now we can't hear you at all. See so if you uh maybe you press press me by mistake. I know uh technical difficulties. Mayana? 
Yeah, she's still on the line, but she uh, I guess we can't hear her. Maybe she can hear us. Yeah, I'm not able to hear her. At this time, Sister Maya, maybe you want to hang up and give a call back? The phone is kind of going in and out. Yeah, let's call back. Let's call back. I, you know, I press number one. Let's call back. All right, so uh, while we're waiting for Sister Maya to call back, uh, Brother Aquete, so say in the kid situation that you kind of brought up, which is something that happens in this space and time, and because this is, a, this is a loose form of a community, whether it be on social media or, you know, you just meet up at a Knesset or a synagogue, um, in the case where in this space and time the woman, quote-unquote, has encompassed the man as it relates to financial abilities, and she's the one who now, it's her, like you said, it's possibly her house and her car, and he moved in with her, and he wants to divorce her. If you go to the, the scripture as it relates to Deuteronomy, what would you suggest in this space and time for this type of scenario? How would you guide the person um, who's coming for, for, for answers in this space? What, what precepts? or principles in the Torah where you guide them towards to get an understanding of what they should do going forward. That is what they should do if they want to get a divorce, correct? Right. If they want to get a divorce, but he's in her, quote, house, you know, she, she pays the bills, and he, let's just say he's a struggling hip-hop artist. I don't know. You know, she pays the bills, and she's like, I'm tired of this. You're, you're acting like, you know, X, Y, and Z. And um, the Torah says that you should write me a bill. Well, and, but all of the scenario is different. You know what I'm saying? It's not his house. Correct. So what what, what, we have, what will you do in that situation? What is your suggestion? Yes, if they two decide to get a divorce, um, the man has to write her a bill of divorce. But even before we get there, you see, the man is the one that's supposed to take care of the woman. The woman is not supposed to take care of the man. If that happens, the man has neglected his responsibility. And the woman can ask for a divorce based on that because that is in the contract. You came to marry me, and before you marry somebody, if it's done right, you have to prove to the parents that you can take care of their child. That is if you marry in a community. These are things that is checked. You know, because we're not in a community, so we do things in a vacuum. But to protect the woman, this is checked. You cannot be an upcoming hip-hop artist and come and marry my daughter. Oh. No. You have to show to me that you can take care of yourself and then take care of another person before anybody will give you their daughter, even if she's working and you're not. You know, there has to be standards. A man has to be a man before he gets married. If you're not a man, can take care of yourself, take care of another person, you have no business going in there. You're not supposed to be a leech. So based on that, the woman can ask for a divorce. And when she asks for the divorce and you give it to her, you're moving out. You're not taking anything with you. What you didn't bring in, you're not taking out. Hmm. Very, very oh. interesting because that, that that goes back to the thought of uh, possibly some of the issues that we are facing actually start during the marriage process based on what you just said. The fact that many people are marrying outside of the advice or seeking consultation from the elders or their family, the fact that a lot of us don't have um, standards of what to expect, or in the back end, we uh, what you're saying is we meet problems because we didn't do it correct in the beginning. Yes, because there was no one to guide us. We did it without the elders, because the elders mm. look at all this. You, you, we ask questions. That is why, if you notice, Abraham did not send Isaac to go get married. He sent a proxy, Eliezer. Okay. You, send, you, you go to somebody. For example, if I want to get married to somebody, I don't even go myself, out of respect. I go to an elder in my community or my parents, if they are alive, and I tell them, I want to marry this woman. Can you go ask for her hand in marriage from her parents? So the parents meet. I am protected. The woman is protected. There is respect from the get-go. I don't take advantage of her. She doesn't take advantage of me. Why? Because these people that we look up to, they were the one who went ahead of us to go make this contact, to, to go bring us together. So 
I have a reputation to keep. You also have a reputation to keep. The whole community is looking at us because there were witnesses at our wedding. Try to make things work. It's not just for us. Everybody is watching because if we succeed, the community succeeds. If we don't succeed, the community doesn't succeed. So if we look at marriage in this context, it will solve all our problems from the get-go. Very interesting because the, your thought, and I'm going to check on Sister Mayana, the thought is not without, um, not without the Torah because you see in the case of even um, Samson, even though he was going after the wrong type of woman, that's exactly what he did. He commissioned his parents, if I'm not mistaken, to go and Correct. get this woman to wife for me. And even Hamar and Shechem, Shechem, after he's violated, he still tried to go back to the original thought, which is to send an emissary, send your parents, send your, your family members to speak on your behalf. Um, we're going to check on Sister Mayana, and we're going to continue this conversation because I know a lot of people are probably twitching from side to side, not in agreement. I know when we did the show about asking your family members, we got a lot of, I don't agree. Are you trying to tell me I need to get somebody to help me? But when we skip this part and we cry in the back end, the same people who you didn't ask, you really shouldn't respect a response because you didn't respect them enough in the beginning Correct. to inquire of them. So how do you yeah. expect them to go to bat for you in the end? So that's something to think about while we check on Sister Mayana. Sister Mayana, are you there? Yeah, Shalom. Can you hear me better now? Oh, yeah, we can hear you yeah. better. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, um, the brother Amasia called me on the other line. I think that caused a bit of a disturbance uh, at the time that you were asking me to speak before. So I heard from, from rejoining the conversation that we're at the point where we're discussing the fact that the elders have to be involved and should be involved. And that goes to the thought that we're not doing an individual to an individual type of union. Instead, uh, when we talk about the marriages, we're talking about a marriage of family. So the idea or the thought that we would exclude the elders and go about, well, um, you know, this is what I want to do, and I'm an adult, and these are my own decisions, and I can, I can, um, I can do these things according to my own will or according to my own desires. And that's one of the things that is problematic so far is that we are, we they, there's very often this this idea that oh everything is a Western mindset, um, and trying to say that because we are here we have been Americanized that we are, uh, we have distant from our Hebraic past and our Hebraic roots to some degree that is true, but it also appears um, in other types of behaviors such as this one where we think that we don't have to um, include our elders and we do not have to include those that have come before us and we don't have to consult the ancestors to do any of the things that are necessary for us to create these marriage unions and covenants. And we create um, a big mess in that way, a very big mess. And this, like Kwati is saying, that we tend to um, bring on troubles that we could otherwise avoid if we were to heed the wisdom of the elders. And that's one of the things that I think that we have been seeing happen in the community so far in terms of how we start to construct the marriages from the beginning. Okay. So uh, with that thought out there, I'm going to uh, continue the conversation and ask this because if there is a there is a, a there's an understanding that you you don't need the, the the Torah says you don't have to consult anyone the man if this is what he wants to do it's fully within his right to write a bill and send it out of of the home is that something that is practical is it something that someone should just take word for word? Or, in, like, even in this space, in this, quote, Western mindset, if somebody uh, wants to have a divorce or they're having marital problems, the, or let me just backtrack, if they're having marital problems, is divorce the first solution? Or is it something that comes when there, there, there can be no agreement met? Because the way that the text is written, it's kind of like, you know, if the man sees someone clean, then he just kicks her out. Like, is that accessible? What are your thoughts? I'm going to go to first Akwete and then our sister Mayana. Is it the first thought, or do you go to counseling, or what does someone do before they reach to that point? Brother Akwete. Yes, it's not the first point at all. It's actually the last thing you think about when everything else does not work. People think about divorce the first thing because we've, dishonored 
the marriage institution. We've made it like child's play. It's like having a boyfriend and just dumping the boyfriend as you wish. We've not been sensitive to it. If we look at the first marriage, Adam and Eve, usually we define marriage as a union. That is a little incorrect because before the first man could get married, he was put to sleep, and then God took part of himself, part of the man, and created an Isha and returned her to him. So it was a reunion, not a union, it's a re. They're coming back together to be one person. So when you get married, you're not two people, you're one. Divorce is like cutting off your arm. You, it hurts. You're amputating yourself. And nobody will go to the hospital and say that, um, you know what, I'm fed up with my hands, so cut it off. No. I mean, you, you go through all the options that you can go through. See if they can, they can help you fix your arm. And that is how sensitive we should be when it comes to divorce. You're not just giving somebody a piece of paper to walk out of your life. Not at all. What if you've, you've, you've lived with this person for a long time? You've acquired things together. You have kids that you're raising. You have to consider all of this before you decide, okay, this thing doesn't work. I mean, we try as a community. We try. Everybody, the, uh, the siblings come in. The fathers come in. The in-laws come in. You take it to the elders. We exhaust all options. If it cannot work, now we can sit down and talk about divorce. But that is not the first thing at all because you, the person is not just walking out of your life. That's what we think when we sit on radio and we debate. Not at all. There are a lot of things that need to be considered before we say we're going to do this and then we come to agreement how we're going to divide the properties that we have. You see, Sister Muna, in the past, and this is what men don't consider, back then 2,000 years ago, women did not work. The man owned everything, the house, the broom, the stones outside, he owns it. But now we live in this community or a society or a time that the woman also has shares. You can't just kick it out. You can't just say, here you go, leave. No. Sometimes maybe you will be, you'll be doing the leaving. So we have, like you said, it has to be practical. You put it in this time and age, and before you give somebody a divorce letter and get, you have to consider all these things before you move forward. Otherwise, uh, you're going to end up in court because it's not 2,000 years ago. It, it's a new generation, and that's why the Torah has to be flexible. It has to be fluid. That's why Moses wrote some, and some he left it oral, so that the judges can sit down and say, because of this, 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 we're going to do this. Because they're taking advantage of our women, when you're going to get married, you have to sign this. They're not adding to the text. They're just protecting us. They're using wisdom to judge so that everybody is protected. I yield with that. Yeah, I'm going to actually call this drop. Uh, you got to press number one. Okay, I'll see you now. You're back in. And Block Talk is bugging out today, you guys. <laughs> Block Talk is bugging out early. But thank you for that, Brother Aquete. Um, Sister Mayana, similar question. Is it the first resort? Or, you know, in your space, in, in, in um, speaking to a lot of sisters, is that is this the thought, like, you know, what what has been your experience in in um, people getting just kicked out and booted out? I've heard that in in my own space as well. But what are, what are your thoughts on uh, the practicality of this this thought process and how people are implying it, and what really happens to people's lives when they just get sent away? Sister Mariana. Right. Well, that's that's true. That right now, because of the fact that the marriages are being brought together with, with um, so casually that they're falling apart equally as casually. And so these separations are, are done with very little thought to consequences or, or whether or not these things are uh, being appropriately executed. And so you're right. So because there was not much thought put in the union to begin with, it's uh, it's light work to send a woman out of the house or or to just completely void out uh, these the alleged covenant, these uh, things that are brought together with little more than uh, bubble gum and a pinky swear. And so 
they they separate with with not much thought <clears throat> to that. Um, but in terms of whether or not divorce is the first choice, again, it's not really a divorce because you're not really married in many of these cases. But divorce shouldn't be the first thought, or separation ought not to be the first thought, as Akwesi said at first. There and you um, also intimated that there should be these efforts towards um, finding out what the issues are, doing whatever soul work is necessary, finding out what things can be remedied, and consulting uh, the, the appropriate people. When we talk about divorce in the Torah, this thing, ha- this thought, has two parts. There's this idea of the separation, and there's the idea of the actual writ of divorce. And um, in the other conversations that we've had and that others have had on, online and in these social media spaces and in other, other places, the idea of the divorce being something that is a matter of, oh, I gave you a writ, I put it in your hand, and I sent you about your business, is something that we're looking at from a contemporary lens. And because we're filtering it from a contemporary lens, then we think of it in terms of you go to Staples and you have Kinkos or whatever, print this up, and, and it's done. It's, it's a very uh, simple process. But in Hebraic times, this would have been a serious deterrent. This is not something you would have done in the heat of the moment. There's this, uh, oh, you burned my food. You wouldn't have that thought because the next thought is in order to be uh, properly rid of you, I need to have a writ of divorce in place. In order to accomplish that, I have to do the, the thing of, of finding the material, getting someone to write this down, because most of most Hebrew, most people would not have been literate as a nomadic people. Your neighbor, if you were illiterate, your neighbor was likely to be illiterate. The scribal uh, people were a class of people. That was an entire uh, status, that was an entire uh, social status to be a scribe. That was not, you know, your 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 neighborhood butcher. This was a, a learned person. So. You wouldn't just say, okay, it wouldn't be worth it. There's the term uh, is sheepa to keepa comes to mind when you think about having to send her out with a writ of divorce. So this would have been a, a deterrent. This would not have been the first thought of any Hebraic person. You know, no matter how upset they were or how, how much they would have been burning in their loins to get the, the, the next thing smoking, if they understood or they knew that they would have to do this writ of divorce, it's just, it's just a, a, a important and a very – uh, laborious process. So people would have would have thought twice before trying to do that. And we also have the example of if a man did want to lay charges on a woman, he would have to go. We we saw this in, in, in I believe it's in Deuteronomy, we see a case of this, where the man decides that there's some uncleanness or something he wants to lay charges against her so that he can be rid of her. Like for example, say, oh, I found her, and she was not a she was not a maid, she was not a virgin, and he lays these charges to to have her uh, executed because if this is a serious charge, he has to bring it to her parents. He can't say, you know, I feel this all by my onesies, and I'm going to kick you out and do all these things all by myself. No, he has to go to the parents, and the parents to have the opportunity to advocate for their daughter, bring it to the judges, and then do something with him. So to this idea that Israel. Or well, Israel is is a nation without integrity or a nation without order, is is for me a very alien concept. Divorce was not a light matter. Divorce was not an easy matter. It was not a matter of kinkos. It was a matter of something that would uh, involve a lot of people. The same number of people that got that union together would have had something to say if it were to break apart. And then this is a so when when the sisters do come and they feel an injustice having been uh, brought into this union, many of them investing very heavily in this union and then only to be ousted seemingly at the whim of the male and then be told that there's absolutely no recourse for them simply because of their their uterus, then obviously there there's some there's some um discomfort there there's some a bit of anxiety to see whether or not that's 100 percent the case so um in the earlier portion of, of the show of this segment so far we discussed that there are steps to have an actual covenant in place an actual marriage covenant and now we're talking about the fact that separation and divorce is not a light matter and it's not something that would have been a simple wave of the the proverbial pen and I think that those are the things that need to be um, fully examined and taken into account. 
Okay, okay, okay. Thank you for that. That's the voice of Sister Mariana. We're going to come to the audience in a, in a few while. Time is flying. It's almost 9 o'clock. But, but I have a few more questions. Um, as we fast forward from what, what you were just explaining, Sister Mariana, so and, and Brother Quete, where where the family are heavily vested in it. Um, I know of, of some places in, in, in Asia and India where uh, marriage is so huge, they actually have marriage insurance. That if anything goes wrong, because they put so much energy, so much time into the marriage ceremony, if anything pops off or anybody, they insure the day. That's wild. I just thought that was wild. But so we, we fast forward in the space where people is like, now nah, we're just going to go to Vegas. It's not really that real. You know, you guys, that's, that's then. That's not now. And now you're in a space where somebody may have said, forget about the elders, forget about the parents. It's just me and you, boo, Bonnie and Clyde, you know, that kind of way. And she meets <laughs> into problems. And the brother is like, and I've heard this before, nobody is qualified to speak to me. I don't need to go to any counseling because no one is qualified to speak to me about anything. Now what does she do in this space where he's not willing to, even if you didn't go to anyone in the beginning, when things have gone awry, he's not willing to go there now. And so you're in a space where she necessarily, or it could be the other way around, for, for people who would be like, yeah, you got sisters who be tripping. You might have the brother who wants to go to counseling and the sister not want to go. But in the case that the brother is the one who has the responsibility of writing um, the bill of divorcement, I'm going to put it back on the brother. What does one do? Because there has been women in this position. He doesn't want to get help, and he wants to. he's on a drowning ship, and he wants to take her down with him. Brother Quetta. Well, wisdom will tell you to run for your life. <laughs> See, it's <laughs> sometimes we get so spiritual we don't use common sense. And I'm very practical. God doesn't want you dead. He wants you to have sanity so you can worship him. So if you're living in a household that is not conducive for you to live in, that's why sometimes you need to separate. You're not divorced. But sometimes Somebody needs a wake-up call that I'm not going to be there if you don't put an effort to make this work. I'm not going to be there. I'm going to separate. I'm going to leave. And you have no option. Sometimes it's just it's tough luck. And, and mm. it, it, it's, it's a bitter pill to swallow. But sometimes... You have to do that. Some people are too reserved. Some are not invested in the relationship. Some just don't care. They're too comfortable. No. You, you, we got into this together. If it's not working, you have to listen to me. If I say we need counseling, come with me to counseling. You might not agree, but because I requested for it, just honor it. You might learn a sin or two. It wouldn't hurt. No, you won't lose your life. Just go and be with me. Maybe I'm the one who has a problem. No problem. Let's go talk to somebody so that we can get help. Remove the ego. If you need help, you need help. Talk to somebody. You know? But if you try all options and it's not going anywhere, sometimes the person needs a wake-up call. I'm not going to be here. No. Life is too short. Sit up. Let's get this working. Or if it's not going to work, get out of it. Mm, I mean, very interesting. Very int- so this thought that Brother Quete introduced is this thought of separation. And, um, again, many go straight to, but she has to, she she cannot remarry. And so uh, for, for some reason amongst you know, these years in the nation, it's, it's either or. Like the thought of separation for some means that it's over. Or does it mean, as you have said, let's give this thing space until one or or both come to their their senses? What does one do in this space of separation realistically? Because in the thought of the woman, it's unfair in her thought. I'm just, you know, hearing because he can, in his, quote, separation, he could just go on. And she's the one who's stuck, stuck in limbo. She's the one who cannot move. What are your thoughts before I go to Sister Mayana? Uh, when you say stuck in limbo, as in he's he's not he's doing what he wants to do because you separated. 
Right. She's the one, if they're separated, and he's like, oh, whatever, you're separated, but that doesn't mean anything. I can I can get, if you're, if they subscribe to the thought, I can get two, three, four Ishas. So that separation is really not having the effect that she thinks it may be having because he is still living his life while her life is on standstill. That means he's not serious about a relationship. You know, if we're supposed to be together, we have to work. Yes, no one is saying that it's not difficult. It's difficult. Sometimes you get hurt. But if one party is not given the effort and he's out and about doing whatever he wants, he's abandoned the covenant. So you have every right to say that this thing is not working. Um, I thought separating will make it work, but it looks like, you know, being serious about it. And if you think it best to ask for a divorce, of course. Okay. All right. All right. Sister Mayana, what are your thoughts on, on this? I ain't going to no counseling. You know what I'm saying? I'm the man, you know, the man, you know, you don't tell me what to do. Blazy, splazy. What are your thoughts on that? I think that when a man is, is coming from that kind of emotive space and that he's in his feelings about things and, uh, you know, he's uh, dealing with pride and ego, then the best thing for a woman to do is to appeal to scripture and say, because what, what happens is if she starts to become indignant, if she starts to respond with the, I think, I feel, I want, I don't like, then that just kind of fuels that uh, that ego issue, say, and then women tend to get dismissed in, in that space. So because of the fact that there are things that um, that govern uh, wisdom, there are things that govern balance, there are things that govern justice, and so instead of there being this, he's rejecting me personally or he's rejecting my feelings personally, um, if he's put in the position where he's rejecting Torah, where he's rejecting uh, how the Creator has said for things to be, the Most High from the beginning said it's not okay for you to be all by your onesies. So uh, if, if the remedy to the man being by himself was to bring the woman and, and not the brotherhood and not one, two, three, four, or five Ishas, then the remedy is what the remedy is. This is what the Most High would have you do, and not to be all by yourself with your thoughts um, alone. And so. Dealing with scripture and saying, you know, these are the things that we are supposed to be adhering to, and these, the the fear of the Creator is what we're looking for. Then we should appeal to our elders. You know, it, it doesn't have to be the one that I like or the one that you like. Let's find someone that we're both comfortable with and have this conversation. If man insists on uh, not dealing with the woman, then Akwati is correct. This is a man that has already divested from the relationship. It is not interested in his company. And there's nothing she can do to make a man be a man in a situation where he has chosen to check out in the in the most childish way possible. And so what she is to do there is is to again uh, the, the law states that in order for her to be free of that union, there has to be some type of severance. And I think that what uh, is important to, to note here is that we're not saying that a woman can't issue a divorce, but she is entitled to to make the, the necessary uh, moves to acquire it and, to, and to, to ask it of him and to gather her people to speak to him and say, listen, this is this is this is um our daughter, our sister, our, our whatever, our neighbor, and um, you know, you you ha- you have already divested from the relationship. What are you keeping her captive for? What are you keeping her around for? What what manner of this is this right there is it's uh, sadistic. It's, there's nothing nothing short of insidious. To keep a woman tethered to you just for the sake of not allowing her to have any type of shalom. Every, all of us are entitled to shalom. And so the man thinking that because uh, he can move about unscathed and leave her. And again, very often, this is not while, while you're trying to 
to uh, punish or poke or provoke the woman, very often there are children involved, whether they're your children uh, biologically, because not all of it, we have a lot of blended families, and so there isn't that same sense of obligation or responsibility necessarily to the children that she came into the union with, but the fact that there are children watching. And that's what we had our last, our last conversation was about what about the children? Very often adults get into these marriages or these situations and these relationships and forget that there are children watching absorbing and then being affected by uh, all of these decisions, whether they are good or bad or abusive and injurious. And as adults, we have to be cognizant of all of these things. We are responsible for their their welfare their emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. All of us are supposed to be uh, trying to be in line with the Creator, not trying to, oh, uh, she pleases me well, or, oh, I can't wait for my king, calling everybody I don't need. That is not what it's about. And it's because we have this kind of obsession with the affirmation of the masculine or, uh, or the feminine, whatever the case may be, that we are very often forgetting about the children and more importantly, forgetting about our creator for, for whom, you know, who, who says very clearly that he is a witness. And I think that's the other thing I wanted to bring out when you asked about what does she do? What about the man who thinks it's all about him? Well, we have to remember that when it came down to uh, being a witness of the union, I'm a witness for her. The creator said, I'm a witness uh, to your wife, the the treachery you have done to her. He took a very firm position on whose side he was on with that. The idea that the women cannot appeal to the creator is not, uh, doesn't bear out in scripture. Even when M. Salah thought there was an injustice against her, she said, let the most high judge between me and you. Clearly she felt that the creator would have judged on her side or that there's a possibility that the creator would have have heeded her, her, her sense of injustice. And advocate on her behalf. Otherwise, why would you kick it into the into the lap of somebody that you thought was going to side with, you know, um, unilaterally, or have a bias against you? Clearly, M. said I didn't feel that way. We have countless, countless examples of women saying that, you know what? I'll just take it to the Creator. So this idea that men have this uh, inherent divine mantic um, ability or uh, or luxury of doing as they please because they so please simply simply is, is countercultural and it's not it's not at all found in torah all righty all righty i know i know if we you know we probably done stirred up the pot here sister mana so we're going to check on brother sal and we're going to check on the audience the listening audience uh if you would like to say something at this time feel free to press one I'm going to uh, check on Brother Sal and see if anybody has any questions or comments on social media or via email or on the phone lines. Brother Sal, are you there? All right. Once again, this is the Relationship Challenge for those that are joined in episode 31. Uh, again, the number is 319-527-6239. I see we have a few people on the phone lines listening to the show. I see some Skypers on the show as well. Again, if you have any questions or comments, just press number one on your phone line or on Skype, and we'll add you in the conversation. We definitely look up, uh, welcome anybody to call in and uh, uh, dialogue and uh, ask their questions or their comments. What we want to have is this. That should be clean, keep a professional, no foul language. And uh, nobody's pressing number one at this time, so I guess we'll just do the dialogue. All right, we're going to continue the conversation. You know, it's interesting when we have these conversations, and many, uh, I think Brother Quete spoke about it, um, earlier, sometimes we are more inclined to or been conditioned to want to um, have a contest of information as opposed to sharing information, deliberating on the information that we have gleaned and coming to an understanding. And I notice that when we're in these spaces, it, it's kind of like, I don't know if it's just the fact that it's laid back or whatever the case may be, but if you have questions or comments or if you don't agree in a respectful way, feel free to press 1 and let your voice be heard because the purpose of this is, as Mayana likes to say, it's not because we have nothing to do on a Monday night. It's because this is the stuff that if we don't address this without the doctrine, without the dogma, without the rhetoric, if we don't speak and give proper information that people could continue on their learning journey, what happens is we're going to have an issue with community because the marriages will not be strong. The individuals will not be strong, and therefore the nation will not be strong. So this is the root work, let's say, to how you bring forth righteous and upright children and strong unions is getting to where everyone feels 
um, in in their proper space. No one is feeling robbed or no one is feeling like once you enter into it. And sometimes women have this feeling. The way in which the information is being portrayed by a lot of Israelite men um, is that once I, I get you in this little trap, ah, I got you now. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, you just trapped the bunny, and now the bunny can't get out. And this is this this makes a lot of women uneasy. So when men are looking for humility and they're looking for submission and they don't find it, it's because oftentimes an uh, environment of uh of an indifference and an environment of insecurity has been created around her. Some people uh, use this thought process to say, you know, um, don't get comfortable, you know, because you're replaceable. You know what I'm saying? They're over there, they'll be singing Beyonce to the left, to the left. You know what I mean? And so when the woman uh, responds in this way, and if people, you know, take offense with my humor, hey, what can I say? I got to throw in my little, you know. But when people respond in this way and she's not, yielding all of her fruit or giving you the fullness of what she can, we have to step back and look at the situation and say, what could be possibly happening here Why this union is not being the best that it could be? So, Brother Aquete, uh, if there's anything that you would like to share, there was another thought that I wanted to bring forth. It eluded me at this time, but I'm sure as you begin to speak again, and Sister Mayana, the thought will come back. So, Brother Aquete, the mic is yours. Yes, Sister Mayana mentioned something about the children, and we usually tend to forget that. There's a profound lesson in the Torah about love. The first time love is mentioned in the Bible, in the Torah, was when God was telling Abraham to take Isaac, your son, the one whom you love. That was the first time love is mentioned. The second time it was mentioned was that Isaac loved Rebekah. And the Torah is trying to compare the two. Because Isaac was loved as a child, he was able to love his wife. The children look at what is going on in their home. I was counseling a a, a gentleman who would beat his wife when they disagreed on something. And And he was not the type of person. When you look at him, You would not think he would do such a thing. So I asked him, why do you do these things? And he said, that is what I saw my father do. So he picked up something that he thought was right, because that is how his father responded. So the children are listening to us on YouTube. The children are in their home observing these things, because that is how they learn. we We are selling our midot, our characteristics. They act based on what they've seen throughout the ages. So we're not just affecting uh, um, the woman. We're not just putting her in harm's way or the man, if the woman is the one messing up. The next generation is looking, and they're going to repeat what they saw. So we have to be very sensitive when it comes to these things, relationships, how to handle dispute, understanding how women relate, how women think, how men think you know, dispute, how to manage this. If we don't do this and take this critical, our communities are going to dissolve. I always say this jokingly. Here in Vegas, you can do a drive through wedding, but they will not give you a driver's license that quicker. You have to take a test. You have to read a book. But when it comes to marriage, nothing is required, I, I, I don't think. We just go get married. And yet, it's more important than driving. So I say the government is more, uh, um, the government cares more about our cars on the streets than our marriages in the community because nothing is required. And if that has to change, we have to try and make sure that that is changed. Get some education about the thing that is called marriage because it's not a nine day wonder, it's not dating, it's not boyfriend, girlfriend. You know, it's something very precious something that we have to approach with utmost respect for the man and then the woman and then the children and then God who is our witnesses even in our houses. 
So, so at this point, I'm going to check on Sister Mayana because there, there's a thought process. We did a whole series on the thought of schools for marriage. Whose responsibility is it to, and I know we're saying the parents, but in this space, if we're going to start like right now, we are here in this broken space for most people with bad marriage models. Where does one start to get or begin to learn the proper models to emulate for their children? Like, where do you go? You know, the person, either the, the, the single mother or the single father or the divorced household or the domestic abuse, This is they've seen all of this. And every, everybody's saying, well, this sounds good. And then they want a quick fix because that, this is also what is happening in the community is a quick fix. To, to fix somebody from all of those years of who they were to all of a sudden, you know, sprinkle some dust on them and then they're going to be, you know, this, this model citizen, it, it really doesn't happen like that. So in, in, in the practicality of what are we speaking about, what does one do? Because what I have seen most people do is take to social media um, and spewing their venom uh, <laughs> concerning their, their failed relationships or their indifferences um, and, and kind of trying to infect other people with this thought process. So, Sister Mayanna, what are your thoughts? Yeah, actually, I got a message from her on uh, Facebook. She says she got to take care of something really quick, so it's going to uh, bypass her and uh, – I'd like to answer that question to back home. All right, no problem. Yes, so Brother Aquete, practically in today, since this conversation is about uh, practical application of marriage, separation, and divorce, uh, when, when people are coming from broken spaces, uh, in today's space and time, uh, uh, to your understanding, are there any tools? What are, is there any training? What what exactly can they do if they're listening right now and are stuck in a space that they don't necessarily want to be? What what can they do? Well, um, Solomon says, "With wisdom, a house is built, not with love." Most people are in love, and that's why they got into the marriage. But they don't know how it works. They don't know the principles. They don't know the dynamics. So that is the first thing that you have to do. You go back to the drawing board, square one. If you have to get books, get books. If you have to talk to people who have been married for a long time, go to them. Get as much information that you can get. Go to seminars that are talking about marriage. Go to counseling. But one thing that you should know, being practical, all the books, all the counseling, all the people that you will talk to does not guarantee that your marriage is going to work. At the end of the day, it is how you are going to relate to the other person, the other person's fault. Sometimes you have to just agree with it. This is how this person is. I'm going to accommodate that. At the end of the day, marriage is two people saying that we're going to stay together regardless of the regardless of is too big for you to bear, that is when you get out. But nowhere, and wherever you go, there's going to be problems. There's going to be heat. The heat is supposed to make the marriage work. And that is what usually I tell people. I can give you all the advice. At the end of the day, it's your decision to make this thing work or not. It takes two. If one person wants it to work and the other person doesn't, you can't force it. But when two people get together and say, regardless, regardless of everything, we're going to make it work. That is, after they've read about it, studied the Torah about it, wisdom first, get as much information as you can get on the topic, speak to people, go to seminars, go to counseling. There's so much materials out there. And then when you come home, now you have to apply it. It's not everything that is going to fit into yours. And one advice, because someone is married for 50 years doesn't mean that they enjoy their marriage. We make that mistake also. So be honest. Ask them, what are your difficulties? What comes into your relationships that sometimes you want to leave? What made you stay? And most of the people are honest, and they will tell you that this is why I stayed. This is why I had to make it work. Or this is how we resolved our problems. When things happen, this is how we resolve it, or this is how we talk about it. You know, just pick up wisdom so that you can also apply, because it's not always going to be roses. No marriage is like that. It's not always going to be roses. And you have to accept that before you even get in. And then from day one, the work begins. It is work, and we have to do it if we want to stay married. 
I think what you what you just shared, Brother Quetta, is, is 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 good practical information. It's good practical information. But I I could foresee someone hearing all of what you just said, and then uh, maybe you say, where in the Torah is that that we should? And I know you said Solomon said wisdom, but one would one would possibly ask, and I know I'm I'm being a little bit difficult at this time, but I've heard again. Uh-huh. Many, many arguments and conversations. What scripture is that? That's one of our favorite things. What scripture is that? You know, the Bible is all I need. I don't really need to read other books. And the Bi- we're, we're getting from, the, we're extracting somehow from the Bible or the Torah that, or the Tanakh that certain type of ways in which men treat women are justifiable due to the same text, if you can understand what I'm saying. And so people reject certain experiences, as you said, and then lean on uh, a broken understanding or their own issues and then come to the Bible and say, this is all I need, and according to this, I can, you know, send you out of my house and I don't have to ask anybody. According to this, you know, I can disavow you. Uh, according to this, I can do all these things, and you really don't, you know, you really can't say anything about it. What what would you say to uh, not even pe- a person? Like, this is like a, a group of people who have this thought process. What would you say to that? Yes. Um, two women came to Solomon with an issue. One baby is dead, one is not. And Solomon had to judge. You see, when you sit in a place of authority that people come to you, sometimes or most of the time, the issues are unique. And you have to draw from wisdom to help these people out. What Solomon did, he did not look into the Torah and says, where in the scripture does it say, how do you deal with two women who are having a dispute? No, he used wisdom because God has given us wisdom. We all say we have the Holy Spirit. Sometimes wisdom is what guides us. So you use wisdom to judge the situation. It's not always written in the text. Because it's not written in the text doesn't mean that we cannot apply our wisdom. God wrote a book and gave, gave us a brain to read it. So without the brain, you cannot read the book and understand it. He didn't make us computers. He, he gave us, we made in his image. We have the ability to think, to come up with solutions, to invent. So, yes, this is how I answer people. You want to go by the text? No problem. Go by it. When you can't solve your problem, say, we are out of luck. The text doesn't say it. Or find a wise person, somebody who you know they're genuinely wise. And say, this is our unique situation. Can you help us solve the problem? And they would help you. They would be glad. That's why it says, ask your parents. Ask your elders. And they will tell you. They will teach it to you. It says, don't remove the stones that your fathers have set. Fathers have wisdom. Elders have wisdom. Adults have wisdom. That is why we go to them when we are in the bind. And we cannot figure it out. I hope you guys have your pen and pads like Brother Sal usually likes to say. This is practical information that we can apply. Again, uh, you know, this is a space that Israel is really hurting. There are there are people who are, um, you know, who are in relationships who don't want to be in those relationships or, or just, you know, again, jumped into these spaces and, and find trying to figure their way out. And we're kind of creating messes along the way. And so as we speak to ourselves and to the children that are coming up behind us, we have to begin to implement some of these things if we're really serious about a return. It's not an if but a when. Um, and so, uh, again, I hope you're really taking note to this information that Brother Quete and Sister Maya and myself and Brother Sal is bringing out and allowing us to have this conversation. Uh, Brother Quete, is there anything else that you were not able to necessarily share um, on during the last conversation? I know one, there was something that came out. Oh, it, it, it didn't lose me right now. There was something that came out. Um, as related to getting back, like Dawid going back for Shaul's daughter, 
and bringing her back in the house. And I remember listening and questioning where, you know, where the Torah already says that even in the case of the divorce and she goes on to be the wife of someone else, that the prior husband cannot go and lay with her. And I was surprised right. to hear um, the thought that if you had a wife before and now you realize, you know, the truth that you're supposed to go back and get her wherever she is. Did you want to expound a little bit on, on that thought um, as it relates to Torah? Yes, I think that where that um, discussion came about when I asked um, about Aguna. Aguna is when a woman is chained to a husband who we don't know his whereabouts. And I believe it was taken lightly and it was laughed over. But I ask this because these are things that happen, that has happened in my community back in Ghana that had to be dealt with. It's true. If your wife, if you give your wife a divorce, and your wife goes and gets married to someone else, you cannot take her back. The Torah frowns frown on that. But what if, practically, what if the man is missing, genuinely missing, we don't know where he's at. For 10 years, he's not come, he's not appeared anywhere. What does the woman do? Is that it? Does she have to wait her whole life? and just wait for the man, not at all. She can petition the elder, and this has been done. It was funny. When it happened, I called my friend in Nigeria. He's an Igbo, the uh, Hebrew Israelite, and I asked them, like, what would you do in this instance? And they said the same thing. I was surprised. The elders can issue the woman a gag. The reason I brought that up is she initiates it. The man is not there to initiate it. But they don't live in the vacuum. They live in the community. So the, the elders will issue her a get. And if the man is to, re- to return, the elders take responsibility for the verdict that they passed. Practical. It's not theory. Practical living. That is why in ancient times, when a soldier is married and he's going to war, he has to sign a get. The get goes into effect if he doesn't come back and he's missing. Because back then you could not, if you went and you were killed and there was a mass slaughter, maybe they could not identify you. So that protected the woman. That's why it's called aguna. You write a conditional get. If I don't come back, you are free to get married. Why they passed that law was because women were being left with dead husbands or missing husbands with, without knowing their whereabouts, and they were stuck. Can't marry anyone else. So Aguna comes into play. And till date, till date, in Ghana, we observe this law, if you want to call it that way. You write a bill of divorce, conditional, should in case you don't come back and we cannot find your body to be sure that you are dead. So that is why I brought that up. And um, I think when I asked, they did not know about it, so I just left it alone. But this is practical. This is life. It's not a joke. To tell a woman who gets gets married at 30, young woman, and something happens to their husband, and she's waiting her whole life, and he doesn't show up, and maybe he's dead. And she could have moved on and had children and had a family. And and as you're speaking, I wanted to explore more the practicality of that situation. If we're going to say it's in a space where the man um, is sustaining uh, the family, if he's not there, no one knows where she is. She can possibly fall into, um, if she doesn't have a support system, she could possibly fall into poverty. Her children could fall into a space where the Torah accounts for um, the fatherless because if he doesn't appear in, in how many decades, yeah, no one knows what has happened to him. I think, like you're saying, practically, are we looking at the fact that she could, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, technically be imagined as a widow. If, you know, no one knows where she is, he is, 
and how yeah. does she take care of herself at this point? So like you're saying, it, it's kind of a security. Although the Torah is not saying this, um, right, yeah. a conditional get, can one see the validity of it? There is also a, a portion in the scripture where the Mosai is speaking to the men going to war, and he's given the conditions of those who shouldn't go. And one of which is if you have, if you have married, if you betrothed the wife but have not laid with her, do you think that this alludes to you know there's a possibility that you won't come back? And so if this is this is if this was going to be on your mind, you know you're excused from duty. What are your thoughts on on that particular scripture? Yes, I was going to mention that, and you you took it out of my mouth. Correct. I mean, there's a, we should sit back and ask why did God give that commandment? You know, you just got married. You're a young person, just got married, and you've been sent to war. What are the chances that you not come back? Maybe you don't even have a child. If you have a child, you have someone to succeed you. So they said, no, don't take that person to war. Because in ancient time, I mean, they might not be able to identify you. Now she's left. She, she just got married. She's left, and what do we do? Somebody would say she's out of luck. Not at all, no. This is why the community, that's why the elders, this is why I said we should set up court and take judges so that they would judge technicalities like this. If we live in a vacuum, we are the lost. Agreed. And, and these are the kind of conversations <laughs> that hopefully righteous conversations and humble conversations that we can have as we are hearing these cases because – I have heard people trying to judge cases in Israel, um, and I've heard people give it, you know, the, the title of the kangaroo court. Like, with, with half the information, you got a half a witness, you know, you're having a, a convoluted story, and then passing down judgment on people's lives. And I don't know how seriously we're taking the thought process that the Creator says you have to diligently inquire you know, you have to diligently inquire in these spaces. And if we don't have the framework to support these people, when we give them advice, um, how 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 righteous is it what we're doing in this space and time? What are your thoughts on that? There, there, there's no one sometimes, there's no people to fall back on. There's no thought of, of taking care of the widow or the fatherless. And yet still we want to pass judgment on these very same people and, and use them to say, okay, you're a single mother, see, you're the reason why you're single and you're out here with these children and, and we kind of, the community, you know, there's a level of praying, if you will, on their status and not really being there to, and I, and I will specifically speak to the thought process of when people seem to push polygyny, it's, pl- it's praying on the status of the women being single mothers, this, that, and the third, and automatically it goes to not taking care of the widow, the fatherless, and the orphan, but now corralling them into your space of um, building your, I don't know, I'm going to try to be nice, building your your economic powerhouse. So what are your thoughts on um, that as it relates to no infrastructure but yet passing judgment and then exploiting those who possibly may be in need? And uh, just to let you know, uh, my aunt is back. And also, we have a question on social media, too. But go ahead, uh, Jose. Yes. Um, if we don't have that structure, that is where we, we get in trouble. Because when we take judges, elders, it's not just one person. We have a group of them. And these are people who know the scripture. So they can take a verse and say, okay, based on this, because let me say this. We are not saying, I'm not saying that the written text is done away with. No. We have to look at the written text. But we take the written text and then try to make sense out of it. We take a text and try to pass judgment based on that text, what we call remit. The text sometimes gives us hints. So if we don't have these systems and then you just give your wife a get, what if she's a housewife? Automatically, she becomes the responsibility of the community. She becomes poor. She has no income coming in. You have just gained more money because you're not taking care of your wife. You're not taking care of the kid. Sometimes we even neglect the kid. But if we have these courts set up, and before someone gets into marriage, we make sure they understand the terms. 
there's a covenant. They are your responsibility. If you don't meet this, this is what she gets when there's a divorce. And that is what I want to touch on. The Bible only says give your wife a get. It just gives you the base instruction. But what is involved before you get there? Because the men were taking advantage of that, now the judges come and they said, okay, if that's the case, now we're going to do this. We're going to get a contract during marriage. And in the contract, we're going to write that if you divorce your wife, you get to compensate her like this. She's not going to leave empty-handed. And the judges or the elders do that so that to protect not their wife and the kids alone, but the community. Because it affects the long run, it affects the community that we live in. That's why we need these elders and our sisters and judges who have wisdom so they can look at the text and then pass judgment. When the daughters of, I, I always find it hard to pronounce that word, the name, Zelophehad came to Moses and they make the claim, it wasn't in the text. Moses did not know what to do. He didn't say you are at a loss. No. He brings it before God. And God says they are right. Now my question is, why did God not put that in the instructions when he gave it to Moses? He left it out. When they came and they said, okay, we understand this law. It's righteous. It's perfect. But it kind of goes against it. God says you're right. What happened there? Can we take some wisdom from there? That even if it's written and we have wisdom to say, wait a second. You know what? This goes against this group of people because of the times that we live in. Let's put a fence around this and say that to protect the woman, this, 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 and that. Are we going against Torah? No. We still go with Torah. But we have to put a fence so that those who want to take advantage of maybe the flaw or the loophole, we can cover that loophole. That is not going against Torah at all. Not at all. All right. Thank you for that, Brother Quetta. We have Sister Mayana back. Before I go to Sister Mayana, I know for those who may, sometimes they'd be like, Sis, what scripture is that? So it's Deuteronomy, the 20th chapter, the 7th verse, speaks to the Aguna concept that um, Brother Quetta was bringing out. And it says, 20 and 7, Deuteronomy, Devarim. And what man is there that hath betrothed the wife and hath not taken her? So he, you know, the promise to marry, but they have not... The whole thing is not completed. It says, let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. So, again, to the concept of, you know, dying, perishing, going into a space. Um, and in this case, he's betrothed, but he's not married. But this situation, when you go to the book of Numbers, you go to the Exodus, you go to all these spaces, men were dying all the time. It's not an unheard of thing. And so when they, when they do perish, oftentimes before their family members, before their wife, what happens to her? What happens to them? What happens to their family? And these are the conversations. We see a little bit of it here. And the next one that charges him not to go out after he's married for a year, not to go to battle. You know. So these are some things that as it relates to marriage, the creator is giving us spaces where T- attention is being paid here. It's not just, oh, I got you, you're mine, you know, and, and, and whatever happens, that's on you. No, there, there's special care taken to to uh, maintain the integrity of whatever it is that you're forming in these unions. But uh, we're going to check on Sister Mayana, then we're going to come to Brother Sal with the question. Uh, Sister Mayana, glad to have you back. Uh, if you would like to comment on anything that you've heard thus far, feel free to do so. Oh, absolutely. I was um, tending to the children at the time over here. <clears throat> but I got to hear quite a bit of, of what you were saying and what Akwati uh, was saying. And I want to go back to and kind of add to the last thought that you just gave regarding um, going to war and the fact that when you first get married, it is the case that the man is not charged with work or war for a full year. And it was surprising to me how many women did not know that that was in the law. So that's one of the provisions, the considerations and the thoughtfulness of the daughters. Because very often we are told that 
the, the Torah doesn't consider us, that the Torah is given to men, and that there's this idea that the Most High only deals with men and that we are not, um, we're, we're not considered at all uh, in, in these spaces. But Deuteron- when Deuteronomy says that, there's a lot of things going on in, the, in that verse. For a man not to go to work or war, that is two ways that a man makes money. Those are two ways that, that a man is able to generate money. So for him to be able to stay at home for a full year without generating any income, that further speaks to a question he's thought before when he said that uh, a man made sure that he was already capable, that he was already in a space and in a place where he could be married, where he could take it, Isha. It wasn't something that he did on the fly. It wasn't something that he had. He did because uh, it was some, uh, he he spied her out and, and wanted to take her on site, or you know she was looking she was looking kind of flat on the corner in the hood. It wasn't something like that. The men prepared for that, and when they were able to demonstrate their capability, that is when they entered into this very serious institution of marriage. So, uh, the, the covenant of marriage is one of the most sacred things that we can do as people. It is one of the one of the most holiest of, of actions that we can do, and so it wasn't taken lightly. None of the things that we did were taken lightly. The fact that we we are so uh, casual with it now is because we have this individualistic mindset rather than the uh, collectivistic mindset of our ancestors, where we think that it's all about us and that uh, they would have thought that it was about the greater family or the greater community and their place there. Um, so also, you know, not, not going to war afterwards would mean that he was not distracted from what? From taking care of her. I said that you can't go out to war uh, so that you can stay home for one year to what? To make her happy. So this idea that if she's trapped in this, in this union where she doesn't feel loved, where, she, where she's being abused, where there's some type of injury happening, this is all uh, countercultural. This is not what the Most High intended. So the idea that she would be stuck without redress, it, it just it doesn't reconcile with something that is so explicitly saying that we're going to think very carefully and very specifically about the mental health of this woman. Because why the woman has to now and, and men make much ado about this. Is everybody on everybody's a uh, playlist that the woman has to be submissive. And the woman has to submit to the authority of the man. Everybody's okay and on the same page when it comes to that. But how does she get there? How does she get there? To be submissive, to submit to another person, there's a degree of, uh, there's a a stage where you have to be vulnerable. You have to have some kind of uh, trust. And that is what you spend a year building with her. And for and if you're spending or you're dedicating a, a year of, of building and bonding with a woman so that she can submit to you, she can feel vulnerable to you, she can trust you, then if you are doing that, you are investing in the union. For you to decide to leave the union or to exclude her from the union or kick her out of the union or oust her, then you have divested. And this, again, as we can see very clearly in Deuteronomy, is not the thought. It's not the thought. And I think one of the reasons why this conversation was so important was because in, uh, in other conversations and in, in, in other uh, things you may have read or seen on YouTube or come across, women are very often given the impression that once they are in a bad situation, they're pretty much just kind of out of luck and that nobody cares. And that by by virtue of, of their uterus, they have been uh, excluded from any type of of um, ability to to advocate or be advocated for. And that's another reason why we kept talking about including elders and including others, because we don't exist in a vacuum, and we don't exist alone, and we exist in whole communities and whole families that other people care. Other people care about what happens to us because we are the children of somebody. Just as we're concerned about our own children, we're saying, what about the children? It's not just, and I said it before, and I'll say it again, I'll probably say it a million times after this, but we have to remember that all of these things at the end 
are supposed to be about the children. It's supposed to we we know that the, the the command is to be fruitful and then to multiply. Amuna and I have gone over this several times in our own conversations, and we try to impart this to others. But uh, being fruitful, that's just one level. The multiplication happens when you go further into the future. That's a distant thought. That is your generations after you. Being fruitful all happens on one linear uh, line of procreation. That's that, and multiply is when you are saying, I'm going to set up some type of stability in this space right here so that that stability goes forward to the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. We see several times in Torah where uh, one, one patriarch is elated, not because of, of their, their own fruit, but because they were able to see generations going forward. We see uh, Yaakov say that to to Joseph, saying, I, I didn't think that I was going to ever see you again, but, but behold, I've, I've been able to see your children. It says that I think that the, Joseph was able to see four generations. And so when we are setting up these kinds of proper steps, when we're saying we're going to do marriage right, we're going to, to discourage any type of thing that would destabilize the union so that we have to talk about separation or divorce. When we do that, then we are ensuring the wellness of those generations. Now, I, I'm, I'm not to, you know, I'm not unrealistic. I'm not going to say that there isn't that kind of hardness. And, and uh, I believe that um, it's been brought up already in this conversation that it's not always one-sided. It's not always that the, the man has checked out of the relationship. Sometimes women check out of the relationship for whatever their reasons are as well. And so there, there has to be this type of redress that handles it. Absolutely, this is not the most high original intent, but you know what? Being Having the, the a hardness against your spouse also wasn't the most high original intent. It's because we have gone so far left of the most high intent that all of these other issues become the problem. We have lost the fear, that fear that is necessary to keep us in line, to keep us in order, that fear of the creator. And instead, we are in pursuit of our pleasures. So with that, I will yield the mic because I believe you said that there are callers on the line prepared to join the conversation. All right, all right, all right. Uh-oh. We're having a conversation, the practical application of these uh, issues that may come up with marriage, separation, and divorce as it related to the scripture that Sister Mayana um, just mentioned. For those who may be new, it can be found in Deuteronomy Devarim 24, Chapter 5, and it simply states, When a man hath taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war, neither shall he be charged with any business, but he shall be free at home one year and shall cheer up his wife, which he have taken. And I just want to just add simply when she's taken, and, and Sister Mine has spoken on this many times, um, when she's taken from her space, her family and all that she's known, you could almost guess that, yes, she may be joyous that she's in a new union, but she's, she's, she's sad because her family, the life, everything that she's known, she has now been separated from. She's in a new space. You know what I'm saying? She, can, she may be homesick. And so to have him the husband not be there or not support her through the time that she's adjusting could prove problematic. It's like when you're transplanting a tree. If it doesn't set properly in the earth, the new place that you're taking, it's not going to thrive. Um, so with that said, Brother Sal, are you there? Let us know any questions that may be in the queue at this time. All right. Once again, this is the Relationship Challenge, Episode 31. You know that number by now, 319-527-6239. Feel free to call in if you have a question. You know, once you call in, you got to press the 1, and then we'll add you to the conversation. Or you can send me an email at debatetalkby.gmail.com. Or if, you, if you're a friend on social media, you know, you can just send me an inbox or tag me, you know, in the comments, and I'll read out your question. But I have a question here for everybody on the panel. Uh, it says, a couple gets married. Husband cheats the entire marriage. Is she required to stay married to him until he gets tired of cheating? I say cheating because polygyny was not in their marriage. They got married by state laws. Uh, uh, Mona, you want to take on that question? 
Yeah, I'll pass it around. I'll pass it around, Brother Sal. I'll go to uh, Brother Quete first and Sister um, Mayana. Brother Quete? Is Brother Quete still on the line, Brother yeah. Sal? Yeah, yeah Quete, you there? Sorry. I was talking, and it was on mute. Okay. <laughs> yes. So I was saying that if that was not in your contract, if I can use the word covenant, the moment a second president is introduced, you have every right to leave. No two ways about it. You don't even have to go into prayer. He has defiled the marriage bed, and he does not deserve to even have you. He, he, he did not give you the respect. It's like if my daughter comes to tell me that the man that I gave her hand in marriage too, is a disrespect to me and the person who came on his behalf. No, you have every right to leave. The Bible supports you 100%. He broke a covenant. Okay, for those who may be like, what? What in the world did he say? Well, he's answering to my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, based on the way in which the question was worded, that the, the, the contingency, because this is what's actually happening a lot, um, I've heard it, in, is that, I've seen it, is that um, the people were married before they came into this way. And then they come into this way, and then the man gets word of having the ability, the, 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 the allowance through Torah, to take multiple women. So he has this, the wife of his youth, who he's married since he was young, and he gets this newfound, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> liberties, and he begins going out there and saying, I'm not breaking any laws. And so if I believe that's the question, Aquete is saying if that's what the conversation was prior, that this was not an allowance, Regardless of his new um, newfound allowances, he would have been broken the original contract. Is that what I understand you to be saying, Aquete? Yes. Okay, just checking, just checking. Okay, Sister Mayana, the mic is yours to answer the question. I would only add to that because that is the case. If the man has, <clears throat> has oh, again, like what you said, uh, a couple is there, a couple is, has a solid union, perhaps it's, it may have its own, uh, problems, but when you come into this particular knowledge and you start to embrace the culture and you find out there are features that were uh, found in the culture in antiquity and say, oh, I want that too, then this is, this is understand, this is just a departure from the covenant, this is true, but it's also the a departure from the thought of marriage because the point of marriage is to achieve a hard with your spouse. To come into a cut. Not for you to say, oh, I want this too. That is a very selfish moment that you have come upon. Someone, you have been introduced to a new thought, and then you feel all, all tingly inside and say, oh, I want that. And you're not thinking about your partner anymore. Now it's not about the, the union. It's not about the family. It's not about the achad. It's not about the covenant. And it's not about what you already have. It's about you want to... Uh, add on to yourself something new and find something that pleases you well. And you're not considering her. And that is what I'm hearing her say. She said, you know, the, otherwise she wouldn't feel cheated on. She wouldn't feel this sense of injustice. If this is something that was being done for uh, supposedly many times uh, polygynous minded uh, individuals will say, oh, this is supposed to be for the, the family the health, the wealth, the uh, so on and so forth of the entire family and that this is a team thing and somehow it's supposed to uh, be to the benefit of the woman. The woman doesn't feel benefited. She feels excluded and she feels as if she uh, an injustice has been done to her. So we see that whatever the ideal uh, for polygyny is supposed to be isn't present in this in this scenario or in this question. So I can only agree with Akwati that uh, the covenant has been broken. The uh, concept of a chad has been completely abandoned, and that the the woman has the right at this point to seek recourse. Now, again, we said before, divorce should not be the first thought. Separation should not be the first thought. Instead, the man should have better information because it's very easy to tantalize the people. 
People like to be stimulated with, the, with, the, with what's new and what's shiny. And so what happens is that as they gain knowledge, as they gain context, as they understand consequence, you know, all these other things that you develop and you go forward and you get information and better frames of references, then let's see if we can educate the brother out past his fascination with it. Because I, from what I have observed, men become very fascinated with this thought. It, there's a fantasy element to it. There's this, this uh, reimagining oneself or getting another type of identity, adding to this uh, king thought that a, a disempowered person would be very attracted to. So this is, this, it's understandable why this is a very attractive idea. But um, once once the, the glitz and the glamour and the, you know, the shine has worn off and you have to deal with the reality of these, these are women that you have to deal with full time. They're full people that are going to need things all of the time. The, the woman whose feelings you are rejecting in the moment, you just brought another woman with what more feelings. These women don't stop having needs and feelings and and. And and they don't need to be with each other. They need that man. And so sometimes that reality sets in. So I would say to the woman whose husband is now uh, being lured in by this Hugh Hefner uh, in in Hebrew fringes uh, kind of concept to to speak to him. Go over these, these, uh, these examples of polygyny in Scripture. Find out how it works. Find out if that's really something that he is willing to to invest in. Because, you know, when, when theory comes into practice, it's not the same. It's not the same. Just because your homies are doing it doesn't mean it's something you need to do. And and, and unfortunately, like, like Imuna said, yes, you know, uh, the men come and they, it's part of their welcome package that, you know, congratulations, you can also uh, have two or three ishas. The other part of that is there's so much responsibility, so much accountability that's involved in all of these processes, whether it's monogyny or polygyny or, or, or any other type of, of relationship, meaning like including your, your brother-sister relationships. All of these relationships hold weight. They hold accountability. There's a responsibility to another person in all of these things. So what I would say to the sister is uh, try to see – if you can have a conversation with him past the the ooh and the ah of polygyny and, and see if he can come down from that high. If if he has truly just divested and doesn't care what you think and doesn't care how you feel, then as we've been discussing, there is a recourse for that and you may have to you may have to explore those. Very interesting, yeah, very uh, interesting. Uh, actually, uh... Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I just have a follow up. I've actually follow up uh, comments from the same individual. Um, they say he's not willing to divorce. That had nothing to do with the culture. He cheated the entire marriage from beginning until end. He never heard of polygyny, but I get what she's saying. That's just a follow up you know, comments. Okay. Okay. okay this is okay. a man that has divorced from the relationship, but doesn't care about her then. He's not even trying. He's not even doing the the appearance of you know trying to pretend that it has something to to do with scripture, which you know on some level I kind of respect his honesty because a lot of people are pretending you know rubbing the Torah on their genitals and saying you know it's all holy, but it's not what it is. And you know, so if this man is just not um, invested in your union, this man has has divested from. Caring, understand. You don't get married for the sake of saying you did something. Like it's not on the checklist of things to do. The purpose. What, what does Malachi say, uh, sister? Because you you tend to quote it uh, more succinctly than I do. But uh, to paraphrase, and Amuna will probably give you the the word for word, the verbatim. But when the two becomes one, so that we can bring forth righteous seed. It's not about. And and it's, it's. I know a lot of adults hate to hear this, but it's not about you. It's not about us. It's about the creator said that I put you together to bring forth righteous seed. It's the concept of bringing forth fruit because every generation is supposed to yield another generation of people to praise him, to fear him, to his glory. And that's what this is all about. Everything that we do, it has to go back to the creator. And I think that we, we are so 
not willing to see outside of ourselves and we're so concerned about our own personal achievements and our own personal happiness that we forget that all of us are here for the glory of the creator. All of us are here for the glory of the creator. So if if, if your union has stopped being about that, then I would say that for sure. And if, if we're not, we're, again, we know we're not thinking about the children. He's not thinking about you. I don't know if you have any children or if you plan to have any children. But if you do have children, then there's a concern there because they need their father. And if their father has checked out on all of the, you know, necessary levels, then we can't pretend that's not happening just so that we can say what sounds good. I mean, I can sit here and tell you to, oh, pray about it. I can tell you, you know, keep the faith. I can tell you all of that, and it, it, it's, but it's very, very empty rhetoric, and I'm sure there's somebody somewhere clutching their pearls for me to say that, oh, pray about it, it's just empty rhetoric. It's, it's empty if there's no practicality behind it, which is why we have labeled this particular uh, conversation uh, the practical application of it, because you pray for what? You pray so that something is manifested. You don't pray to, to say, oh, I pray today. It's not something that you do mechanically. It's not something that you do to fulfill a technicality. The reason that we pray is so that we can have communication with the Creator in full expectation that something is going to, there's going to be an answer of some sort. And, and, and uh, we have all agreed at some time or another that sometimes the answer is just no, but there's always an answer. You don't pray for the sake of praying. You're not throwing your pennies down, you know, the the the, the uh, proverbial black hole just to to be uh, wishing upon a star. It's not what you're doing. So okay, and rather than give you empty rhetoric, uh, I, I, rather than repeat what I'm saying, I'll let Imuna go ahead. No, I was going to say I'm going to push back a little bit just for the listening audience. Um, so some would say, okay, leave. That's that's easy to say. Uh, some people are are stuck in spaces because of financial. Um, Issues and not having some people are, are saddled, some women are saddled with a number of children, and they're saying, I can't move out of the space even if I wanted to. And then if you go to a Torah testimony where it's clear that um, Abigail had lost a level of respect for her husband in dwelling with him and um, even confessing to another man that he was a fool, you know, as his name implied, Nabal, but she didn't separate from him. She she stayed. She suffered wrongfully, which is, some would say, righteous. What say you to suffer wrongfully? He's doing all these things, and perhaps by your prayers and your beseeching the Creator, his, his, his uh, uncircumcised heart will become circumcised. He will turn from his wickedness, and you will be there to embrace him. Because this is also within, for those who... Um, subscribe to the New Testament, this thought is there that, you know, you, you maybe by you he'll be, you know, remembered. What are your thoughts on that? I'll go to, um, I'll go back to Mayana and then back to Brother uh, Aquete, that, that Abigail didn't leave. She stood there. She stayed even in the, in the face of the, the madness that her husband um, was into. What are your thoughts? I think, that's, I think that's a great point. I'm glad that you brought that up because Abigail is often – Pointed to, and I think there are certain assumptions that are made about Abigail that I'm not 100% um, necessarily comfortable jumping to. One, there's nothing to say that Abigail was necessarily under any type of particular oppression personally. Because, and I say that because we see that whenever when she got to the point where she saw that Nabal was going to bring down some kind of, some kind of problem to the household, she didn't feel that she she wasn't without recourse. Like my my conversation to the to the sister who or the person who gave the the problem was to look into your into your recourses. See what you can do. Advocate to who you can advocate to. You're not you're not necessarily leave. We'll find out what you have to do. What you can do. Uh the girl didn't feel stuck. She didn't feel like, oh well, you know, Nabal has done it again and we're all going to die. She felt like she said, you know, I can summon up these people and I can do something. And she did something. She didn't sit and take anything. She had a recourse. She took advantage of that recourse and she did what she was supposed to do. And nowhere in scripture is she considered contentious. She's considered wise. By whom? By by the record and even by that we who sees this woman approaching or, or instead of her husband and speaking on behalf of the household instead of her husband. And like you said, accurately assessing the character of that man 
and asking that that not be what what um what that, that we moves on, but instead to consider her and her actions and what she is showing on behalf of the household. So this is not a woman that sat there, sat behind anyone, and got put upon. So, and also that leads me to believe that Nabal wasn't doing a whole lot of oppressing her because she didn't, she didn't have that, uh, that sense of having a broken spirit. A lot of the women that, um, that I have come into contact with that are in relationships that are injurious or oppressive, I have, they have a bit of a broken spirit. They don't believe. They have, they have lost their confidence. They don't know what else to do. Like you said, they're, they're very occupied with their um, – they become very conscious of the fact that they have all of these other burdens. I don't have the money to move. I have, I left, like we talked about before, the woman leaves her network and her safety net to go be in this man's house because we are, in addition to being a patriarchal uh, society, we're also a patriarchal local society, meaning that we go to where the men are, to where they are located, instead of to them coming to where we are, which would be natural local. And so because she's not necessarily in her hometown or around her people, there's this kind of sense of disconnect from all those things that would have been safeguards for her, or at least there's a distance, um, even if it's not a complete disconnect. So I, get, I think to, to in summation, what my thoughts are regarding that in, in the example of Abigail is that Abigail is someone who sees that she has a husband that makes foolish decisions and has a propensity to to put them in, in, in poor situations or bad or perhaps even dangerous situations. But she isn't without recourse and she doesn't appear to be at the state where she's a broken spirit or that she's bought you know, boggled down in any way. And she still is fully aware of her 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 avenues of redress. And if women can have that you know, there are sisters that say, okay, well, I can't get through to him and he's going to do what he wants to do, but they can still summon up resources and do other things to survive and, and do other things. Then, then if they can use Abigail in the, as an example, then, you know, hallelujah. Okay, brother, quickly, thank you for that, Sister Mariana, because, you know, I got to just push back a little bit because some will, be, some will be there listening and saying, well, that's easier said than done. You know what I'm saying, or, or walk a mile in my shoes, or you don't right. understand, and things of this nature, uh, this level of uh, disempowerment, and, and some may be based on how they initially got into the situation. We have to keep it real that in this space, many people, men and women, burn bridges because, you know, they came to the truth. So now i got to burn all the bridges, you know what I'm saying, because you, you're still in the church. You know, although you might have been with them like two weeks ago, but now you wake up. You know what I mean? So now everybody's you know going to Sheol, and you're the only one that's saved. And and because of this, you know, they just gasoline a lot of bridges, and literally people are um, painting themselves in a corner. They, in their minds, they're really stuck because how am I going to face these people again? How am I going to go back to the mother or your father or your family or your friends who you, you know, flicked off three months ago and say, now I need your help, without having to hear them say, well, see, I told you so, X, Y, and Z. Um, Brother Quete, what would you like to add to uh, the caller or even the conversation about Abigail not leaving, even though the husband wasn't necessarily compatible? Um, I think the first thing I'll say is this person is not Abigail. You have to be realistic. Um, you, you're not living in the same time frame, and Abigail was not being molested. Um, I don't think that Nebal was cheating on her. Rather, she used wisdom to save her household. So I'd advise the lady also use wisdom. When Sarah noticed that Ishmael's behavior was going to affect her generation, her child, and those that are going to come out of Isaac. She told Abraham he has to leave. So sometimes it's difficult. I know it's, it's easy to say, but sometimes the right thing to do is to leave for the sake of the children. Yes, maybe you're not working. You have to find something. You have to come up with a plan. And one thing I want to say, we have to deal with the decisions that we make. This is why it's important not to just get married. 
you know, you, you, you might not have known and you got into a situation, I understand, but you have to deal with it. We all have to bear our crosses. And when we're able to get out of these um, not too nice, nothing to write home about relationships, we don't get back in. So I, I would use Abigail as she did the right thing. She was a woman of wisdom, and she was able to save her household. I don't think that she was being molested. I don't think that the husband was taking care, um, taking advantage of her. You could see that she also has some authority in the house. So if someone is taking you for granted, you know, show them that you're more valuable. You know, gone were the days that women, that men chased women. You know, women were so precious. You know, respected them. These days, it's 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 sad, very sad. All right, thank you for that, Brother Quete. Like I said, I have to ask the questions because, again, uh, again, a lot of times we're like, we look for the, what is kind of similar, but I do like what you brought out as it relates to wisdom. That's the um, common thread that has been going through what you have shared tonight is uh, using wisdom in certain of these situations and assess your individual, you know, you can draw from the testimonies. That's what they're there for, but you definitely um, – you don't always repeat everything our forefathers did, but we definitely have the opportunity to learn from him. I'm going to check on Brother Sal and see if we have any questions or any additional comments in the queue. I know we're approaching the 10 o'clock hour, so Brother Sal might want to give his spew on, on Black Talk Radio and, you know, the cutoff and all that. Brother Sal, the mic is yours. We do have another question. Uh, via social media, and I'll ask the question about the question one. So let's take the call real quick. Let's go to 917 214 Hi, Sister Lola. 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 Hi, Nabal mistreated Abigail to what Mayana was saying. He was churlish, but it never said that he mistreated Abigail. <clears throat> because I know a lot of men in the world, they may be jerks to everybody else. But when it comes to their wife, they treat them like a wife. That's one thing. And I know Abigail is the go-to to give women false hope to stay with the man until that man is put to death before that woman can move on, but Nabal wasn't put to death for Abigail's sake. He was put to death for reproaching David. So I just wanted to, you know, touch on that a little bit. And that's it. Thank you for calling, Sister Renee. This is this is why we have conversations, um, because, again, I, I was just playing, you know, Sometimes we just pick out that one thing. We don't, we don't have no petals on the flowers. We don't have nothing, no stalk, nothing. It's just that one shiny piece, and we pick it out and, and then say, well, what about this? And what we're doing, the exercise, and hopefully we're demonstrating an exercise in this council, basically. We're deliberating and having a discussion of people who are knowledgeable about the text and um, in a very calm manner discussing it. And so that all of the information can be brought out and we can look at it and say, okay, all right, X, Y, and Z. And so this is, this is the difference between just saying, you know, you know, precept upon precept, line upon line, here, little, there, little, and you're just going to pluck one little spot with no context, no pretext, no subtext, none of that. And there, there's a great danger in that space. So I want to thank Sister Renee for calling in and helping us to further demonstrate, hopefully, when we're going to the testimony, when we're going to the law for instruction, that we don't leave wisdom behind. That's the first thing that Solomon prayed for. He, Solomon was well aware of what kingship looked like. Dawid is his father. So can you, sometimes we take things out of context. We're like, Solomon, Dawid is his father. He saw what happened to his father trying to rule the people. He said, you know what, I ain't going there. The first thing I'm going to ask for is wisdom to rule his people. And so this is the wisdom that we hear, Brother Aquete, continually when we get into these spaces. We should, you know, if you're going to emulate anything that Samuel did, is ask the Mosai for some hakma. Can I get some wisdom here so that I can be able to see and understand what it is that I need to do in this space? And agree, the text never, does, never says that um, Abigail was abused. At the same token, 
you know, there's other spaces where I've heard people drawn that, that the woman or the man is supposed to suffer, you know, for unrighteousness, like they suffer wrongfully, and that somehow that martyr mentality, that martyrdom of the individual translates to righteousness. And so this has a lot of uh, women and men in spaces that they're being abused because in their mind they're suffering for righteousness. That might be another show, um, but definitely. So thank you for that, Sister Renee. Brother Sal, you have any more callers or questions? On our social media. <clears throat> Do you recommend living with each other before getting married? Brother Sal, I don't know about everybody else, but you was breaking up for me. Can you repeat that again for me, please? All right, hold on. Hopefully you can hear me this time. Can you hear me loud and clear? Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. All right, the question is, Oh, let me get to it. It says, do you recommend two people living with each other before getting married? And if so, how long should they live with each other before getting married? All right, I'm going to throw this question to Sister Mine, and then I'm going to come to um, Brother Quetze. Uh, to my understanding, it's a question about shacking up. That's what the question is? Yep, That's what up. I heard. That's what you heard? I thought I heard shacking up. Sister Mine, I'm going to give you the shack up question. Go ahead, Sister Mine. I'm going to have to advise against playing house. This is not what we. Uh, I know that this sounds a little sardonic. Um, it's not my intention to sound sardonic and, and call it playing house. But you know, when we're children, that's what we're doing. It's it's you, you're just you're living together and going through the motions of, of marriage. It, it doesn't without the safety. And the commitment and and the the things that go along with actual marriage, it seems I I can't for the life of me understand why anyone would do that, because what happens then is that it, it what are you going to live together and what not do all the other things that come with sharing that kind of proximity when when a woman went into the to the husband's house, it was to it was to complete the marriage covenant. It wasn't prior to the marriage covenant. So I, I, I need to, I, if the question to, to be very succinct, uh, no, you should not live together prior to having the commitment. Because I don't know if we, if we gave the, the steps before, but here are the steps. To marriage and order is extremely important. Anyone who has, you know, spent the, uh, the first day in in, he- in Hebrew thought, we we're always this thought is always emphasized to us over and over again that the Most High is not the author of confusion. That all of these things must be done in order. That there's a there's a there's an order, a protocol, a standard. All of these things. We are peculiar people. The Most High has all of these rules for us. And so the, there's this idea of the commandments, the, the idea of the statutes. The Most High is very heavy-handed, and there's an order to things. The marriage is no different. Don't get to, to, to go switch down the, or, or shake up the Yahtzee sticks with, with the order. The order has a particular order, uh, uh, sequence. And the sequence for marriage is... There is the, a consent between the families, this consent. Then there is a covenant, it's something established, there are rules, there are expectations, whatever, between these families. There's, a, there's an understanding, a standard is set, and there's a covenant. And then after that, arguably, because it happens in some places, it happens, it doesn't happen in others. But traditionally, there's a celebration, and there's a reason for that celebration. It's not because everybody wants to break out the yayim, you know, and 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 uh, and break up the breads and have the matzo, what have you. It's so that the families can participate in the joy of their children. They get to see the children. The neighborhood gets to bear witness to the thing. This is not something that's done in secret. Uh, the the function is a function, the practicality. To the celebration The first two steps all happen Inside the home between the families And then we come outside And show that to the public with the celebration And finally There's the consummation And the consummation is the culmination Of all four steps But those things have to happen in that order 
Those things have to happen in the order. We see throughout Torah when one of those things are not in order, that immediately there's 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 the the, the shift to get it back into order. You can't shuffle it around because if there's, immediately there's a problem. If 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 the the couple lays together before getting consent, big problem. They have to go back and get that consent. And by then they could have completely blown the shot because the father could now say no. So it's not to to throw water on on your on your burning passions. That is not my intention. But instead to to keep the fire from burning out, it's best to to light the matches in, in the appropriate order. So no sister or brother, I would dis uh, I would discourage you from trying to pursue this outside of the appropriate sequences, if only for your own safety, well being and, and spiritual longevity. Because what we want to have is sustainable unions, not uh, quick, quick unions, you know. Uh, so, you know, with that, I'll, I'll yield the floor. All right, Brother Aquete, thank you for that, Sister Mariana. Brother Aquete, the question was, should they live together for before marrying? If so, how long? What are your thoughts? No, you're not supposed to live together before getting married. Um, so how long? Zero. The right thing has to be done. Somebody wants to marry you. Somebody wants to spend the the rest of their life with you. They have to put value. So they have to go through the right process. If it's going to take a year, they have to wait. Living together doesn't change anything. You can live together for five years and still have problems. So why do you want to find out the problem before you get in there? You know? This is what is important about marriage. You are marrying everything that comes with a person. So living with a person won't change anything. It won't change him. It won't change you. But to put value and respect that this person came and married me, and then I moved into the person's house. That's that's the order. You don't want to live with a person, um, spend all your time with a person, and then after being used, for this long, he decides, I don't want you. I want someone else. No, that's devaluing yourself. Let, we want to keep the value up. And they have to go through the process like Sister Mayana just stated. All right. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, Brother Salad, any more questions or comments? Yeah, I believe I have one more question here. I think this is the yeah, This is a short one. It says, Covenant broken and bed de- and bed- <laughs> read it again. Covenant broken and bed defiled. Now what? That sounds like a debate talk for you topic. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> they the um, yeah, the covenant is broken and the bed is defiled. Ah, uh, a question. That's that. Well, now what? Ah, <laughs> uh, well, you have <laughs> you. Hmm. Let me understand the question. So the covenant is broken, the bed is defiled. The president asked him, what's the next move? Yes, what's the yep. next move? That's what they're asking. What's the next move? Oh. Yep. Yes, so it, it depends. Some individuals, when their heart is broken, that's it. Some people can stay and still work things out. We are all different. I mean, it takes a lot. I mean, those people who can stay, regardless of... Um, the, the covenant being broken and the bird bed being defiled, some people can still stay. Okay? Some cannot. You cannot tell the person who cannot to stay. No. Some work it out. If you can work it out, you want to work it out, awesome. That's another marriage saved. If you cannot, please do us a favor and then speak up early. We don't want you sitting in this house you're worried. Now there's a, there are free radicals in your system. Now you have a tumor. Now you have cancer. We want to avoid that. So, uh, as usual, wisdom. If you cannot cope, if you cannot let go, it takes grace to do that. If you know why like that, the choice is up to you. You got to talk about it. And if you guys decide that it's not going to work out, maybe you need some time. You need to separate. Get all the help. First, if it cannot work out, 
your choice. All right, this is Ayana. Covenant broken. That was good. Good thought, um, brother Quetzal. Because as you were speaking, I think I think of the Creator, and really the status that Israel is in relation to the Most High, committing, you know, covenant broken. You know, covenant broken. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and this this connection between the Most High defiled. Now what? Um, and so, you know, there's a space where the people are. Continuing to replicate this 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 inf- this infidelity um, amongst one another in the same way in which we do to the Creator, and so there's a connection, and all throughout the text you hear the Most High speaking about this connection, even having his prophet to get into this space where he has an ad- you know a covenant breaker um, to to wed, and so as you said, people some people are willing to continue to repair, some people um, walk away. And it really, you know, that that warrants sitting down with the person and the person really understanding what it is that they're trying to do and where it is they're trying to go. Because there's some people, and I'll come to Sister Maya, there's some people like in the nation, once they, they realize the most I rebuked them for the sin, they won't go back there again. And then there are others who they, they'll just keep going back and keep doing the same thing, and you kind of have to know what you're dealing with. But Sister Mayana, is that somebody okay? Somebody wants to say something? Okay, no. Sister Mayana? I would like to say that I hear the problem, the idea of of there being the broken covenant and the, the bed undefiled. And like you said, that does sound like uh, the Bay Talk for You topic. It sounds like one of the titles we would have come up with to discuss. And I think the reason why we would discuss it is because there are so many variables. And one of the things that you and I very often say is that it, there isn't any wisdom in trying to uh, adjudicate something like that without all of the pieces in place. So I would hesitate to to give a definitive response to now what because of those variables and the fact that I'm sure that the the person posing the question and the person that, that the person uh, the other person involved in the question would have other details that would help to flesh that out so that we could deal with those nuances. Like we said, we're not talking about dry, you know, cold cases. We're talking about living cases that these, that, that these people have to live with the consequences of these. So um, as, as elders, we, we tend to be, or we should be, very cognizant and be very careful about how quickly we dispense judgment. You know, we're not vending machines. It's not the, the, the proper code that you push and, you know, out pops the, the, the answer. And so because... I feel like this this person um, is dealing with something. Has uh, is going to have to deal with the consequences of this. Right? I would like to to say, you know, what Quetzi said to to deal with the variables of it. That it would depend on what's at stake and what's involved, and and how how we came to this to this case, and how was the bed um, defiled? In what way? Through what conditions? Under what circumstances? Uh, are you willing to work it out? Are you willing to, you know, how much have you taken already? You know, what kind of conversations have already been had? Those kinds of things. Uh, Amuna spoke to the fact that, you know, we are we are asking for the Creator to take us back um, in our soiled garments and our and our sullied wedding gowns as His bride, um, which is my which is usually my chief criticism is the those men who want to speak very poorly of sisters who are no, no longer in their necessarily their virgin states or they're not in their pristine states um, as as returning and broken people, we still expect to be accepted from the Creator, and um, so that's why throughout the conversation we have we have emphasized that divorce or separation cannot be the first thought. Is not the first thought. Even in the in the ability to have the writ of divorce, even that is not a light matter. There were no kinkos back then. To say that I'm going to give you a writ of divorce was a huge decision, possibly an extremely fine. You know, uh, they brought up with it a financial burden. So you know, this idea that you know, you know, we kind of want to just throw our unions away. That's a so it's a very contemporary idea that is something that can be done. Divorce is not easy. Reconciliation 
it's also not easy. But you know, we have to to adjudicate those matters cautiously and with wisdom. So, to the brother or sister that posed that question, um, seek seek counsel. Have someone sit down and talk to you, someone that you trust and you can share those details with, and and can help you kind of parse out those variables. And see what Torah has to say about your situation. Torah, you know, doesn't doesn't isn't an index of every possible variable, but we do have a, a significant a wealth of information and, and quite a few examples that we can follow. So potentially there's a there's an answer there. All right, all right, all right. It's getting late. It's ten twenty. We're gonna check the phone line. If we don't have any more callers, we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. I know I heard a question said at the top that he was a little tired. So we're gonna be considerate of that and thank him for tuning in as well as Sister Mayana. We holding it down while Brother War is not here today. I definitely miss his voice and hope he's doing well. Um, Brother Sal, do we have any more questions or comments at this time? Uh, once again, you know that number, people, but I see we have one more question. Let's wrap it up probably with this question. Um, he or she, can they remarry? I guess they're asking if we get a divorce, can you remarry? I think we did it. We did a show on that um, because it depends on what angle you're coming at it, I would, I would say, based on the fact that you have a vast array of Hebraic thought um, floating around in the atmosphere. And so this that this is a conversation that, again, bears, you know, the Torah says yes. If you're coming from the New Testament through the Torah, then one will say no. And then one has to continue to do this diligent research um, and beseeching the Creator so that they, within their mind, don't just go on what somebody's opinion is, but really getting that um, understanding in and of themselves. That's what I would say, because just based on my experience with Israel, you're going to get two totally different answers. One person is going to say yes, and the other person is going to say no, and you're going to be confused. So uh, that that's, but according to Torah, if it's done properly, then the person is able to be remarried. Okwete, and then I'll come to Sister Mayana. I second that. You're right. I'll go with what you All right. Go ahead. Sister Mayana? Uh, then I put my third on that because you know, <laughs> that's a poor You already know it's going to be a crazy conversation, you know, depending on what, you know, how did you arrive at this point, you know. You, you're going to have to go through some... If you if you ask if you ask a Torah panel about a Torah question, you're gonna get a Torah answer. And according to Torah, uh, as the sister said, if you go through the proper channel, if, if you do it the way you're supposed to do it, Torah has a, it's a two step process in Torah. And so very often that's not understood. In fact, the the idea of it being a two step process is consistent. It's consistent. You find that also in Sirach, you find it in the New Testament, even if you were to to look at the, the the writings of historians of, of the time, that there's a, there's a the thought of separation and divorce, and so it's and the writ. So there's the putting the person outside of the home, the actual separation uh, of the couple, and then the second portion of there being this writ. It, it, it's documented. It's in the hand of the other person. So at least both two things have to happen. It can't be, oh, I'm going to hand you this writ, but you know you're in the room next door. Or you're in the other room. You know, <laughs> we're divorced, but you're in the other room. Like it, it can't be that. It has to have both. I can't, or, or you can't be sent out of the house, but then you don't have the writ. You know, the the divorce hasn't been in effect. You have to have both both of these um these um parts. And as uh, the sister stated, we did a show on that. So the caller or the, the querent can go through the relationship challenge um, playlist and see that. I think, is that the is that the one where we talked about uh, did the New Testament do away with divorce? I think we go into divorce uh, in some detail in that segment. Correct me if I'm wrong, sis. Oh, that's it. That's it. Did the Messiah do away with the divorce? That's the name of that panel discussion. So you could definitely check it out on the playlist if you have any additional questions or comments. Um, so thank you for your questions, Brother Sal. Any more questions before we go ahead and wind on down? Uh, yeah, no questions at 
uh, 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 the person uh, wants to re- have you reach out to them, they gave me the email. So we definitely appreciate you all, you know, uh, you know we do this in real time. You know, you know I can tell you, you are going to tell a lot of women out there. And then it's like, you know, you, know, you can take the time to let people know what you, when it comes to like, you know, helping people. I, you, I don't know if it was my phone or yours. I only heard the end part. I know you said the person wanted to reach out. So, yeah, we can link in the the box. Again, you know, there's a lot of stuff. All hands on deck. That's all I have to say. You know, all hands on deck in these situations. These are real. You know, I've had people, Sister Maya, I've had people, I'm quite sure, Brother Quete, you know, people in tears. You know what I'm saying? People broken, families jacked up, children all over the place because of uh the hardness of the hearts of, of people who are in these spaces and, and taking lightly um, the responsibilities, even if, you know, I quote, don't like the person anymore. So this is real time, real life, and we we need to take these conversations seriously and understand that it's not a game. But I'm going to go ahead and ask for some closing thoughts at this time. Uh, Brother Aquete, what are your closing thoughts on the conversation? Um, and anything else that you would like to add, feel free to do so at this time. Okay, um, often when um, a couple split up, the question is not why did they get divorced, but rather why did they ever get married in the first place? And in many cases, people are getting divorced for the right reasons and um, getting married for the wrong reasons. Um, I would say that high divorce rates should not scare us away from getting married but rather it should strengthen our resolve to take marriage very seriously and ensure that we are choosing our partners for the right reasons. Um, What are the right reasons? I think that's another topic that we can talk on. With that, I yield the mic. Agreed. You know, speaking as someone, and you might be tempted to say, oh, these people are talking about, you know, marriage. You know, how has their marriage been? I mean, speaking as someone who... um, you know, didn't have necessarily the right information. In, in in your youth, you make mistakes, and so some of this some of this uh, conversation is from experience. There's a there's a saying in the in the Caribbean that experience teaches wisdom, but really experience teaches wisdom only if you allow it to. You know, because the fool would just keep experiencing the same thing over and over and not not changing anything, you know, and then people say that's the definition of insanity. And so a lot of this, myself personally in this conversation, is is, is, is just knowing firsthand that some of the ways in which we attempt and just watching people around me to go about these things is going to lead, end up in a wrong place if we don't do something to fix it, you know. And so definitely don't think that, you know, people have an experience, oh, you will never understand, you know, that's not necessarily true. So I just wanted to put that out there. Sister Mayanna, what's your closing thoughts for the conversation? Uh, In close to add to what Imuna is saying, you know, it is true that very often we look to others and say, well, what about you? And I think that there's some kind of wrong, in in a lot of ways that's wrong-headed because we're not trying to emulate each other. Instead, we are to look to the wisdom of, of Torah. Torah is going to be consistent. We have plenty of examples of, of what our foreparents have done. And many of these examples we are saying, oh, let's copy that, when instead we are supposed to be saying, okay, let's learn from that and let's move away from that. And these case studies are, are given to us as lessons not only um, what we should repeat, but those things that we should avoid. And um, I think that if we are to privilege the wisdom of Torah, and we say, because that's, that's going to be the constant, our our friends, our neighbors, even our elders, are not going to be our constant. As, as Sister Muna said, we are still, in many ways, um, making the same mistakes. You know, we're learning from them also. And we're trying to to repair not only each other but our own conditions and our own situations, and this is why we and this is where we lean harder on Torah, and we lean harder on the wisdom of the Creator. Like like you want to point out earlier, the, we, Solomon said, you know, Solomon had Dawid. All of us are running around quoting Dawid, and he had Dawid. Dawid was his father, and he did not feel like Dawid was the answer. 
He went to the creator and said, if I can have anything, give me wisdom. I don't want to. I don't want to be able to to say, oh, I want to be like Daddy. I want to. I'm, there's something else that needs to be understood. And Solomon did not quote Dawid. He said, I still need wisdom. I still need you. And I think that that's what we need to continue to do. We still need to look to the Creator. The examples that He places there before us. And in terms of the marriage, I think that Akwati. Akwati summed that up so very well. That right? we are looking at um, divorce, and it, yeah, some of us are divorcing for the correct reasons. But it's because we're not we're not taking seriously our marriage covenants in the beginning. And I think that that's what a lot of the problems are. In my experience, not even what I think. This is what I have experienced, what I've observed, what I've seen. Is because we don't understand what marriage is. We don't understand what a foundation is about. We don't understand how to commit and to sustain these unions. It's like, oh, let's go get one. It's not. It's not an east. It's not. It's not an egg hunt. It's not a, a treasure hunt. It's not a let's go pick this up. It's not a, a uh, something to do off the checklist. I, I have my Hebrew name check, and now let me go find an ish or isha check. You know, what I mean? you cannot do that. Because what we're trying to impress upon you is that there are real life consequences to this. These things are what you're what you're betting your life on, your relationship with your Creator on, how your children are going to grow up behind you on, and it doesn't even have to be your children, your nieces, your nephews, the other children that are around you, the 